you know, if you're being harsh and you're pushing somebody that, that it can be good, but if you're always in that, that negative emotional frame, that's something that uh, I really enjoyed was the, the emotional context of memory. Talk about yes. that. So how, how do you think that plays into the kind of emotional arena that you set up for the athlete and how does that play out and how they're going to perform in the sport? Yeah. So it's really interesting. There's, there's a number of layers to that, but I think for the listeners, there's this idea of, of mood congruent memory. And so if, if I'm in a positive mood and let's say I'm, I'm learning a skill or an attribute of a skill, what we know is almost like a hashtag memory seems to be, or excuse me, the emotional state I was in when a memory was formed becomes anchored to that memory such that when I am back in that emotional state, so in my example, one of positivity, mm-hmm. I'm more likely to remember that thing. Uh, conversely, if I'm in a negative emotional state, it tends to color everything that I'm learning and experiencing. And so as coaches, if we are trying to create this ethos in this environment of growth mindsets, and rather than looking backwards at what I can't do, looking forwards in what I can focus on to improve it. You know, I collectively see that as a spirit and call it an emotional environment, to use your word, of positivity. And if I can create that mindset in training and cultivate that mindset in competition, what we are actually literally doing is creating the emotional conditions for those movements, those skills, and those patterns to be recalled. But if we create this constant environment of negativity and fear and danger, but then we get to competition day and we're patting everyone on the back, like, okay, great job, now go out there and have a good time, there's almost this contrast in the emotional state of where something is being learned and the arena that it needs to be emotionally executed in. Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast, where we bring you the most interesting and enlightening conversations around movement practice and how you can become the most heroic version of yourself through pursuing movement that's relevant to your nature. This is a podcast that's going to feature some of the top movers in the world, some of the most amazing movement thinkers, and people from fields that are related to movement as far afield as evolutionary theory, strength and conditioning, and everything in between. So if you're interested in movement, Please stick around, and if you like our work and want to support it, please consider supporting us on Patreon because this podcast is completely listener-supported. We don't want to take any advertising. We don't want to interrupt your experience of watching the show. So what really helps us get the best thinkers on, have the time to put these together, have the best quality for you guys as far as audio and video is your support. So please consider supporting us and enjoy the rest of the show. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Evolve Move Play podcast. So today our guest is Nick Winkleman. Nick Winkleman is the author of a new book called The Language of Coaching, The Art and Science of Teaching Movement. He is also the Director of Science and Performance at Irish Rugby and formerly the Director of NFL Combination Prep um, at Exos Athletics. So he is a guy with a great pedigree in the industry, um, a really profound thinker, and someone who probably has done more than anybody else to popularize the most up-to-date motor learning research on how to communicate effectively with athletes, particularly cueing. So Nick is somebody who I think anybody who teaches movement really needs to be paying attention to. He's had an immense impact in my own work and the effectiveness of my ability to work with athletes. And we get into that. We actually get into some of the cues that I use and how I've learned from him uh, later in the conversation. So I think you guys will enjoy that. It's a wide range of conversation that goes very deeply into understanding these things. And you'll find that Nick is not only, you know, an uber geek about understanding how to help athletes prepare, but someone who's intensely curious and passionate about understanding so many things around philosophy and science and life and training. And I had an amazing time with this conversation. Nick is one of the people I've been most excited to interview since I had John Verveke on the podcast. So I think you guys are going to enjoy this. Before we get to the podcast, though, we need to talk about the upcoming Embodied Movement Summit. So that's coming up just in three days from now. So this is dropping on Monday the 13th. The next, uh, the, the Embodied Movement Summit starts on the 16th. So John Berbeke, who I mentioned um, before, he's going to be speaking on the first day, on the 16th. We're also going to have Ryan Hurst from GMB Fitness. We're going to have 
Paul Check uh, from the Czech Institute, who's an incredible figure. We'll probably have him here on the podcast later, as well as Ryan. Um, later in the weekend, we've got Yosef Fusik from Fighting Monkey. We've got Simon Thacker from Ancestral Movement. We've got Kelly Sturet, Juliet Sturet from the Ready State, who've been guests on this podcast and are some of our favorite people and biggest supporters. Uh, we've got Marlo Fiskin, who's a great friend of ours, who is an amazing dancer and teacher around movement and flow. Uh, we've got, um, I believe I've mentioned Yosef. We've got Aaron Cantor, who's been on this podcast before. Um, it's just an incredible lineup. We've got Tom Wexler again, who's been on this podcast um, and one of my favorite movers. So we have a real diversity of speakers, um, people who you know come from strength and conditioning backgrounds, from parkour backgrounds, from dance backgrounds, from uh, natural movement backgrounds, capoeira backgrounds. And we're coming together to really try to answer this question, how do we build a better culture around movement? A culture that actually gets people motivated. Right now, the way that we're looking at it is through the lens of sport, which can work well if you're talented, um, young and athletic um, and, and competitive. But even for those people, it only really lasts for a short period in their life. Um, and then most of the rest of us are kind of operating this fitness paradigm that treats the body like a machine um, that we go to a factor to be a uh, factory to kind of assemble. And it's incredibly boring and not meaningful for people. So we're asking the question, how do we create a sustainable practice for life? And we believe that the answer has to do with creating practices that are deeply meaningful and that connect us to flow states, right? That connect us to our own sense of mindfulness, that connect us to nature and that connect us to community and that help us become something that's meaningful to us, that develop not just a physical appearance or not just a set of arbitrary physical qualities, but skills that are engaging and intrinsically fun. So this is gonna be the focus of this. And we have speakers who are gonna be touching base on all these things. It's gonna be an incredible event. So it's free. Um, you can sign up below, don't miss it. And we look forward to seeing you guys there. So without further ado, though, this week, we've got Nick Winkleman. Thank you. Nick, welcome to the podcast. It's wonderful to have you. Hi, Reef. It's great to be here. Yeah. Cool. So my first question for you uh, is, if you were a, a double agent from another country hired to prepare an athlete, but your job is to make them perform as poorly as possible, what would be your top tools? that would make it look like you were doing your job as a coach, but would allow you to disrupt that athlete's preparation as much as possible? Well, I, I can officially say that's the most interesting question <laughs> I've ever been asked. Um, if, well, there's many ways you could answer that, but I would say from a coaching perspective, if I was to choose a single one, it would probably be through the spirit of overcoaching and providing them with excessive information uh, rarely do you observe a coach who appears to be uh, educating the athlete and giving them all the de details on the biomechanics, the program design, and, and what they're doing you know, before, during, and after the movement itself. Rarely would you see a parent look at that coach or another person and say, they're not doing their job. Mm -hmm. If anything, that would be applauded. But on the experience of the athlete, trying to digest, consume, and apply all that information simultaneously probably would end up with more frustration uh, and, and negative outcome than it would positive. Yeah, I think it's a nice way to, to think about, you know, what we want to have is if we can think of the opposite frame, right? If we, if we recognize where we break as coaches or where we, yeah. uh, where we fail even when we're trying to be successful, um, it's a really great uh, starting place to see what actually works. That's oh, what hundred percent. I love the reframe. No, it's really helpful. Interesting. So yeah, the ones I've come up with are, are, are over coaching, uh, internal cues and, um, emotional environment that you provide as a coach, right? Like a lot of times people think about, you know, if you're being harsh and you're pushing somebody that, that can be good, but if you're always in that, that negative emotional frame, that's something that, uh, I really enjoyed was the, the emotional context of memory. Talk about yes. that. So how, how do you think that plays into the kind of emotional, um, arena that you set up for the athlete and how does that play out and how they're going to perform in the sport? Yeah. So it's really interesting. There's, there's a number of layers to that, but I think for the listeners, there's this idea of, of mood congruent memory. And so if, if I'm in a positive mood and let's say I'm, I'm learning a skill or an attribute of a skill what we know is almost like a hashtag. 
memory seems to be, or excuse me, the emotional state I was in when a memory was formed becomes anchored to that memory such that when I am back in that emotional state, so in my example, one of positivity, mm -hmm. I'm more likely to remember that thing. Uh, conversely, if I'm in a negative emotional state, it tends to color everything that I'm learning and experiencing. And so as coaches, if we are trying to create this ethos in this environment of growth mindset and challenge, but challenge progress, and rather than looking backwards at what I can't do, looking forwards in what I can focus on to improve it. You know, I collectively see that as a spirit and call it an emotional environment, to use your word, of positivity. And if I can create that mindset in training and cultivate that mindset in competition, what we are actually literally doing is creating the emotional conditions for those movements, those skills, and those patterns to be recalled. But if we create this constant environment of negativity and fear and danger, but then we get to competition day and we're patting everyone on the back, like, okay, great job. Now go out there and have a good time. There's almost this contrast in the emotional state of where something is being learned and the arena that it needs to be emotionally executed in. And so even down to if I'm watching game film and I'm trying to get them to absorb something physical, you know, in my opinion, get them to stand up so that they're in kind of this physical standing powerful posture and so that the right emotional state, so to speak, is being anchored or tagged to, in that case, the information I'm trying them to take on board or the physical movement. There's a lot of richness in that, and great coaches do it, I think, by chance or choice, trial and error. The emotional environment is as critical as the literal environment. And this is some of the reasoning why it directly impacts our ability to recall things. Yeah. So, you know, with my work, what we're interested in is kind of looking beyond just the, the scope of the direct tr skill, right? But also yes. thinking about transference between skills, but then transference to life, right? Very often when you hear people talk about why sport, they hear this idea that it builds character. Um, yeah. And so, when I think about that, when I read that, what I was thinking about is if you if you're constantly utilizing like negative emotion to drive performance, how is that impacting the person they're becoming everywhere yeah, else? Most certainly, and that's the thing. I think to your point, you know, developing the, the character and the way that person thinks about themselves and their experience is as important in the context that we are learning and nurturing it as it is outside of it, 100%. You know, at the end of the day, we talk about there's still, in my world, a person behind the player. Mm -hmm. And it, it is, we, we cannot separate the experiences, positive or negative, that we generate in that sport and learning environment from those that they'll take home with them. And just as we want them to take the physical movements home and learn and be better, they also take home the conditions those changes were born in, i.e. to your very point, the emotional conditions, positive or negative. Just a footnote on that, I was chatting with someone the other day who has worked in Olympic sports for a long time. And they mentioned to me that they were speaking with an athlete after one of the, the summer or winter games. And the athlete said to them, and they had performed quite well, I'm so happy this is over. Yeah. You know, the, the, the experience in leading up and the stress during was at such a level that it wasn't positive for them. And so to your point, the echo beyond the learning environment very much so will be laced in their experience emotionally. And will they walk away not only hopefully performing better physically, but also walking away with something positively emotionally. And so I think you bring up a great point. Yeah, I had a, do you, do you know who AJ Roberts is? I don't, no. He's a, he's a power lifter from Westside Barbell who uh, broke the squat world record twice. Okay. I met him at a conference called Paleo FX. And he, he basically told me that he, um, you know, in the preparation for the first time he broke the world record in the squat, he was in pain every day. Um, yeah. And he woke up and basically had to make himself angry enough, right? Had to focus on his faults and insecurities enough to get himself motivated to drive to the gym. 
And, you know, every time he walks up, he's, in, you know, supposed to be an incredibly fit athlete, but every time he walks yeah. upstairs, he's out of breath, you know, he has to eat so much. He's on the toilet constantly. It's painful. Yeah. And uh, he's, you know, cruel to his girlfriend because he's just angry all the time. Um, and he breaks the world record and he, he doesn't feel anything. Yeah. And he's like, well, I guess I just need to do it again. So he goes through the process for two more years wow. and reaches the end of it. And again, nothing. Right. And then, then he sees the writing on the wall. Um, but it's something that, that really struck with me because at that time, you know, I was kind of towards the tail end of, of like trying to compete as a parkour athlete. Yeah. And I had been injuring my body a lot. And part of it, I think, was, was that I was, uh, I had, had gotten too much into the dark side emotionally, I guess. Yeah. And I think that that that's something that that is really we don't know when we see somebody we see that they're performing extraordinarily well we actually don't know where that's coming from and if and if it's coming from a place where you know like okay you're the world champion and you're the best in the world and you're the world record holder but actually your experience of it is miserable was it worth yes. it no uh, well 100 percent. and I, I think while we're talking positive and negative, we also don't know the perception of that. The words positive and negative are, are constructs. They're, they're averages. They're what we as, a, as general people feel this on average is probably going to be perceived as negative and this on average is going to be perceived as, as positive. And so some people gain strength from, call it a more negative tilted environment. Other people gain strength from a positively tilted environment. And, and one thing within what you're saying that, that I'm hearing is both as individuals and as coaches who work with individuals, it's first and foremost just seeking to understand what makes them tick. Where do they gain their strength from? Where do they gain their joy from? And in doing that, we have to respect and put, put our biases oftentimes at the side because what drives one person might not drive you. It doesn't make it any better or worse. It just is. And learning to help coach them within their source of strength, I think is important. As long as it's obviously not detrimental to them or mental. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's actually, that gets to the nuance in the question in some sense, because uh, I was going to bring up the, the last dance, right? The new uh, yes. Jordan documentary. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, I have. <laughs> so before I, before we touch on that, um, you know, parkour was, was, uh, is, is the primary sport that comes behind my work with the ball move play. And that was founded by these nine guys in France who are immigrant kids who grew up yep. in poor, you know, um, you know, underprivileged conditions. Let's say they grew up in the Benlous, which are essentially the ghettos of Paris. Um, yeah. and they came from families that had traumas of various kinds. And there's a split that happens between David Bell and between the rest of the Yamakaze and, one of my main teachers, Stefan Bigru, he trains with David. He goes to train with David and maybe he becomes extraordinarily good. But he, he talks about training with David as kind of the dark side of the force. It was like, if you're standing on the edge of a building and you won't do the jump, David will push you off. Yeah. And he'll call you at two o'clock in the morning and say, you now have to do two miles of quadrupedal all in the middle of the night. And everything was, was kind of motivated from this place of, of, uh, of you have to be strong right? You have to be strong and, and there's no room for anything else. And so, so Stefan, um, he, he tears his ACL on a uh, shooting for Nike, right? Doing a, a commercial. Okay. And, and he had been basically with David every day. And then David essentially abandons him and everyone else on the team abandons him because the idea that someone could be wow. weak was unacceptable to them. So then he meets Williams, who's David's cousin, who's one of the Yamakaze. And, and Williams, is completely accepting to him basically teaches him that for him the training all comes from the space of love and so I, I was really like really in, engaged by that story and really started thinking about like you know how, how are we preparing people so that this will be something they'll do for their whole life and and how can we give them that that love and I've run like with Stefan he's like I never I'll never tap that that anger anymore I'll never tap that um, He's still there, Nick. There we go. Yeah. So yeah, he, I am. he's had enough of that. Right. And is, yeah, is there any for sure. And then, um, you know, I've talked to some of the other guys, you know, uh, top guys in the world. And they said that, you know, if you don't have a little edge of anger, you just can't do this stuff. Yeah. Some of them yeah. Stuff. So it was interesting to watch, you know, uh, the last dance documentary and look at the way that 
Jordan prepared, right? And how he yes. used so much anger, but also there was so much joyfulness that you saw in him. Yes. And I was thinking about, you know, you've worked with a lot of elite athletes and how do you see them fueling themselves and how do they avoid that trap of going so far into the dark emotion that it becomes the situation that we had with AJ Robert? Yeah, no, I think it's, well, uh, you know, talk, talk about nuance and, you know, I think there's, there's many ways and many routes to try to unpack this, but let me just comment briefly on my interpretation of Jordan yeah. in terms of what you said, because actually I think, I think we agree completely in that his, his teammates and actually probably more than I fully appreciated. You know, I, I've read various biographies uh, around Michael Jordan, you know, for me growing up, he, he was the guy, I was a Blazer fan, unfortunately. And so I was a Blazer fan and a Michael Jordan fan. And that, that was basically for my me. world. Exactly. So uh, when I look, when, when I look at the interviews and, and I reflect on the biographies uh, that I've read of him, I, I did feel that the overall sensation of perception of his teammates, not so much Phil Jackson, but his teammates was one that, yeah, you know, Michael pushed us, Michael challenged us. And obviously they use far more colorful and even somber language uh, in the last dance. But there's a scene, I can't remember if it, I think it's at the end of episode seven. And I actually came to find out that the end of episode seven in the scene I'm about to describe was actually the very first scene that they ever shot in the two years of filming the documentary. And that's more or less when he's asked about his teammates' perception of him and how hard he is on everyone. And as we're saying here, the dark side. And he starts to cry. And as he's, descri as he's describing the way that he is, it came from such a place of sincerity and truth and, you know, word we're using nowadays, vulnerability, that it was in there. You can tell there's such great joy in what to others is perceived possibly as a dark space or, or a negative space. And that's where he's an extreme case. He's an outlier. For the vast majority of us, if we look at the way he approached creating a competitive fire in himself and others, you know, it, it was on the side of negativity. It was on the side of darkness. There was a lot of fear built into that. But you can tell that he, at least the way I perceived it, is he came at it from a tr true place of love and joy and positivity and the way it manufactured itself on average was perceived by others as something quite the opposite. And so I don't singular N of one and the way he approached it can represent the, let's say the ad campaign of what sustainable motivation <laughs> Yeah. looks like. I, I think for many people, that form of motivation is like a candy bar. You take it, someone's screaming at you, yelling at you, go, 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 right? It's the coach with the whistle. You're going to get through that session. Heck, you might even get through a couple seasons. But when we look at the sustainability of a bowl of, of oatmeal versus the Snickers bar, well, the oatmeal is going to be far more sustainable. And so I like to look at this in terms of sustainable emotional states and yeah. sustainable motivational states. And I think as you talked about the individual from a parkour perspective, that negative space was not a, a sustainable emotional or motivational state for him. But granted, it is for some people. It is for some people, and that is important to recognize. Otherwise, people like Michael Jordan and his coach would never have existed. His sustainable source of motivation and emotion came, as you said, from a place of, of love, or what I call focusing forward on not what I can't do, but what I can do right now, and putting one step in front of the other in the spirit of, of growth mindset. And for me, that most certainly is my sustainable form of motivation and, and emotion. And that's what I lead with as a coach and then seek to understand what's, what's behind the curtain. So it's, so it's so interesting at the end of the day, but it's the outliers versus the averages. And that's what we're talking about here. So if you, so I think, you know, with your coach hat, right? If you have an athlete like Jordan in your group, right? then you, you need to be able to recognize his ability to fuel off of a source like that and then go back Absolutely. and find the joy, right? Because that's the thing is even though he, he's finding ways to get angry at everybody in the game, 
somehow he's he loves and enjoys the game at the end of the day you can see you know at the in the last episode they talk about jordan's superpower was presence yes he had zero fear of the shots that wouldn't go in he had zero you know self-consciousness in some sense um Mm. and that that's ultimately i think like maybe the most powerful thing that we're seeking through sport is that ability to drop into presence in the flow state well i take it one step further i think that's what we're pursuing in life i mean what is life if not to be absolutely utterly present in the moment i'm in right now at least at least for me and that's why i do believe you know mindfulness and, and mindfulness meditation and obviously the deeper forms that sit behind it are are so popular because even though they're difficult and, and many of us do it intermittently or maybe you've even only done it once the reason we're interested in it is because the 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 province of of mindset and mindfulness is something we all know that we need we want more of and we the question is can we challenge ourselves enough and give up enough to actually get good at it and you know it's it's interesting with michael he seemed to have an affinity for it it was part of his game it was part of his superpower but i'd also be interested if he was here right now to ask him what we perceived as this utterly present person was something that he was just naturally gifted at or something like the rest of him he practiced and pursued as a craft Mm -hmm. yeah and you know of course phil's the zen master right he is yeah absolutely absolutely so um that's interesting because what we've evolved in, in within Evolve Move Play is like from the base of, of this parkour practice and then taking it out into nature is this idea of, of kind of four columns that help us reconnect to the most important, meaningful aspects of life, which is uh, m- movement, mindfulness, nature connection, and community. If we pr- have practices that allow us to more deeply attune and cultivate ourselves to all of those, yeah. um, that's incredibly powerful. So... That, that actually leads me to another question that I wanted to ask you, which is you talk about the idea that the job of the coach is to get an athlete's attention and direct an athlete's attention and maintain it, right? Uh, did I get that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Capture, keep, and direct. Absolutely. Capture, yes. Keep, direct. Okay, cool. So what occurred to me as I was thinking about that was the value of concentration meditation. So it's one of the things that I think of as a core practice is just learning to concentrate. And I look back at, especially the early period of my parkour training and almost all of my injuries were the result of lapses of attention. Yeah. Um, And I wonder if you, if there is research now on that question of can, can you see an improvement in a people's ability to stay focused within a sporting context based on use of a mindfulness practice? Yeah, really interesting. I, I can't say I know of any, let's say, direct, call it transfer studies, where they took a group of athletes and had a, a certain base level measurement. Let's say in sport, we might use things like uh, eye tracking. Yeah. Eye tracking gives us a, a direct way to tap into what the the athlete is paying attention to in certain sports. So I don't know of any that said, okay, here's a baseline, let's call it attentional profile in a skill, put them through 12 weeks of mindfulness meditation or some practice uh, similar, and then did a post-test. It very well could exist, but I haven't seen it. Uh, However, in principle, we know that mindfulness most certainly changes the brain. And in my understanding and study of attention, what we're, what we're increasing, people think of attention as this thing that we can grow almost like memory and that I can pay attention to more things at once. But rather, as you allude to, what we're trying to get better at is concentration or the ability to focus attention on a singular point for an extended period of time, which, which by its very nature is embedded in the practice of, of most meditations or mindfulness, notably breathing. And so I believe that the skill of paying attention uh, in principle can be improved. But I'd be interested to know if in your own practice, you felt that transfer to parkour, because I would also feel that to a large degree, there's, there's a specificity around attention in that we tend to pay attention to the things that uh, most interest us that are most important to us. And we also know that attention is impacted by fatigue. So it almost seems in in something like parkour, one, if you love it and you've been taught to focus on the right features, your case, 
you are well conditioned to make sure that fatigue is not eroding your attention as you get tired. And then you've augmented that with, with mindfulness that for me does two things. One, it reinforces the psychological power in your own mind that, wow, attention is important. And as the practice, focusing on how I focus needs to be front and center. And then finally, are there any, let's call it transfer-based benefits of mindfulness? And my instinct says, uh, absolutely. But I think it would be a mixture of those three variables that I'm sure others I'm not thinking of that ultimately would uh, extend in your experience that you could pay attention better while you perform. I'm going to pause just for a second because um, the, the connection is really bad. I'm going to go walk and record next to my modem and see if it's better. Okay. Give me yeah, one okay. Perfect. No worries. Again here. Um, so you're talking about three, three core things. And unfortunately the, the connection got broken. So I didn't hear the first of the three. So what's sort of the three that you were talking about with uh, regards to attention um, and how we see transfer? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the three variables that just come front and center to, to mind. Number one is, uh, you know, what we pay attention to, we ultimately have to be motivated by. And so motivations can take on many forms. Yes. I would definitely say in parkour, one of your main motivations is probably one part joy, one part survival. <laughs> and so luckily survival is a pretty powerful magnet for attention. But then once let's say you have to be passionate, you have to be interested, curious is probably a great word. And things that bring about curiosity tend to also bring about attention. And so that's why with, with many sports, if people aren't learning, if they're not paying attention, it, it begs the question, you know, have they lost their fun? Have they lost their interest, their curiosity? And I think coaches, just as a footnote, play a very large role in that. I mean, how many kids loved sport growing up, but then when it gets really competitive, that starts to dissolve. And we see a drop off in, in numbers of, of those playing sports into later stages. I can't help but feel that part of that is how we create, as you said earlier, the, the conditions of the learning environment. And to say what we want the soft stuff is the motivating battery pack of, of motivation and attention. Uh, so that's, that's variable number one. Variable number two, obviously, is just one of a bit more of a, of a physiological piece, and that is fatigue. We know that when we get fatigued, oftentimes motor control starts to deteriorate rapidly. Well, that's in part because the machinery of motor control, the muscles, the nervous system is becoming fatigued, but also as the ache in our muscles supersede, let's say to a certain level, we start to pay attention to it. This is why people like to listen to music when they're doing really hard cardio sessions is because it starts to distract them and allow them to focus on performing, performing, performing versus slowing down. So fatigue is another thing, conditioning to be considering when it comes to your athlete's capacity to pay attention. And then finally, as we were saying earlier, just the, the physiological capacity to attend for long periods of time. Yeah, I think the research on mindfulness shows we can change the brain. We can change how we attend to things. And thus, I think that is a, as a third piece is probably the, the biggest area of unknown. How does mindfulness practice possibly transfer to the way we pay attention in specific activities, notably like parkour? Yeah, yeah. So um, the, the first time you answered the question, you, you talked about the idea that, that when we learn to pay attention, also what we're doing is maybe not even opening the capacity for attention so much as as cutting out the things that drag on that attentional capacity. So it's like you have a bandwidth of attention, um, but you, your, your mind tends to generate a lot of noise that's essentially eating up that bandwidth. Yeah, 100%. The way, and I, I use an analogy that's probably useful here because I think it's a really interesting topic. And so I use it in the book. And so a bit of a thought, of it, thought experiment, and this is, this thought experiment illustrates how attention and memory interact. Because oftentimes when we think about attention and to use your word there, capacity, we actually confuse it. And I've confused it for a long time with memory. So the way I think about it is like this. Memory is like a dark room. It's fixed in size, in size and it can only hold so many things. Okay. And so we all know with working memory, uh, if someone gives us a phone number 
or we're at a social gathering and we're being introduced to all these different people, we're only going to be able to hold on to so much of that information. And so it's almost kind of like the, the luggage closet at a hotel. You can only put so much luggage in there, but it's a dark room. So I can't actually see that information until I have a light. And so attention is that spotlight in the dark room. And we can only look at one piece of information, one number, uh, one name to use my examples at a time. And so as humans, we have this false sense that we can pay attention to many things at once. We, we have a false sense we can pay attention to multiple different ideas in the same instant. And the reason we have that false sense is because of memory. We know that it's in there. We know that it's in the room. And because we can access it, we feel we can access all of those things simultaneously. But the reality is attention only can focus on one thing in a given moment. And the reason that's of relevance is especially in sport is because things happen so quickly. Uh, and so if we're trying to contemplate two or three things in one instant in an action or emotion that takes a fraction of a second, what we're experiencing is flicking our attention to many things at once, but not actually paying attention to many things at once. And there's a difference there. And that's why there's books like The Myth of Multitasking. Mm -hmm. And so as coaches, we have to start to condition the athlete to pay attention to the right thing at the right time that will pay out the greatest dividends. And, and I believe that's a central tenet of effective coaching. And we do that, obviously, hence my book, through the nature of how. So I think you see, we're, we're going to say through the nature of how we communicate, right? Yeah, the nature of how we cue or communicate. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay, so um, yeah, I was when you were talking about that, I was thinking about the flow state and the idea of hypofrontality, yes. right? That that essentially, um, when the athlete learns to attend to the right thing, then they're actually able to uh, to 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 essentially get out of task switching and the cognitive costs of task switching across different attentional focuses. A hundred percent. Is actually going to be making less effort because it isn't shifting its focus as much. And you know, the, the way I think about how we do this, and when it comes to movement, it's heavily related to how our body goes about controlling movement. And so imagine a GPS. And I think this is a useful way to look at the difference between you know hyperfrontality versus hypofrontality. When you get in your car. What you do is you give your GPS one source of information. That's all it requires. It requires an address. And once I put that address into the GPS, I can then trust in the GPS to tell me to go left and go right and go down and your destination is up on the right side. I don't have to think about any of that. It's, it's automatic, so to speak, as long as I follow the instructions. And so for me, when we talk about hypofrontality, and the ability to be focused on that one thing and be, if you almost become that one thing, that singular intention, if you would, that's like putting the one address in the GPS. The alternative is to try to memorize, okay, go up a block, take a left, go down a mile, take a right, go up around the barn, the destination is on the right side. And that's the step-by-step -step approach. And many coaches, unfortunately, they undermine themselves in that they, they give the destination, they give the address, they give the cue, the outcome, the thing that the athlete should focus on, but they also give the athlete all the varied steps. But they don't tell the athlete, hey, these steps are just FYI. They're just for you to know. They're knowledge. But it's this one thing, it's this address, this destination, this focus, this is all you need to worry about. This is all you need to centrate your mind on to perform effectively. And so a big thing that I try to do when I teach coaches about communication and cueing and is that it's not that we can't teach the steps, but we have to understand the steps describe what should happen. They don't provide the information on how to achieve it. That's where the intention 
That's where the destination, so to speak, to use my GPS analogy is. And so oftentimes I think we can promote, call it flow state, or we can promote singular focus by giving a singular focus and making sure that the individual knows there's a difference between the knowledge of what and the capability of how. And we're trying to promote the latter. Absolutely, yeah. I definitely wanna dig really deep into that. Um, but let me just, there's a couple things before we get there. So the first one is, um, you, you asked a little bit earlier about the, the idea of transfer with, uh, with parkour, right? And yep. in, in concentration meditation. Um, I have noticed a transfer, right? And, okay. and I feel like even with like loving kindness meditation, interestingly, because like having that emotional frame, I feel like protects me when I'm doing high risk things. But one of the ideas that I've noticed is that if you have a, like these two connected practices, one is the, the concentration, one is the physical aspect, actually it becomes much, it's, it's hard to get yourself to focus on focus meditation until you realize, oh, I'm having to focus all the time in my sport and if it's better, and then we, we can kind of intentionally create this linkage. I think there's a lot that has to do with, with like I think that transfer between activities is improved when you are intending to transfer them. I'm curious if you, if you have any thoughts on that. Yes, I think I do. And, and, and I pause because you're getting at something is very nuanced and that I've been looking at and thinking about deeply lately myself. And, and, and what we're just, it's almost like this psychological readiness to, to develop, this psychological readiness to learn. And, you know, it's really, it goes back down to this idea of the emotional state and the psychological state I am in when I'm trying to consume information. And, and really, the phrase I was looking for that finally just percolated was, almost this idea and there's a book by this name the biology of belief mm -hmm. how the how the belief in something uh, in the mind can propagate its uh, actualization in in real life and so i'm reading a book right now called the cure by joe montgomery and its subtitle is is you know mind over body or something to that effect but basically the whole book is on the placebo effect yeah. and the nocebo effect mm -hmm. and how it is it's a it's a substantive finding that oftentimes we talk about placebo as a throwaway but in many instances placebo is a, a, a powerful mechanism to if you want to call it trick course or believe your way into physiologically changing and so in what you're saying is if i believe a practice is going to transfer and improve in this case mindfulness to parkour or mindfulness to sport i don't see that being very different than believing that this medication can help me and, and in fact my body follows suit and it does and just to give one example from the book uh, she 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 talks about this well i'm just gonna i'm gonna make a a, a, a I'm going to make up a version because I don't remember it in detail, but I'm going to give a, an analog to what you talked about. But imagine that there's this given medication. And one group uh, gets the medication on the first round. Another group gets the, the medication plus a placebo pill. And they know it's a placebo pill. Okay. So they take the actual medication plus one. It, it, it's, like, it's like a red and blue pill. And they know that there's nothing in it. Okay. It's just call it sugar, sugar water. And then there's a third group that, that, gets, that gets nothing. And then what they do is on the next round, let's say after a month, they've done a month of conditioning, on the next month, group one gets the, the normal pill again, and then group two gets half of the dose, half of the dose, plus still they get the placebo pill, okay? And then I actually, actually misspoke, the third group got the full dose, but now in that second month, they just get the half dose. So one group has full, full, one group gets full half with placebo pill, and one group gets full half with no placebo pill. And in the specific study they were looking at, they actually showed that insofar as the medication impacting symptoms, there was no difference between the full medication group and the half medication group plus the placebo in the second 
month. And then almost like Pavlov's dog, we start to create this conditioning effect where our mind and body associate this placebo pill with the actual medication and the actual effect. And so after a month or so of conditioning, quite literally, they can start to reduce the medication as long as the ritual around taking the placebo pill at the same time is done. And, and she demonstrated this across a number of studies. Now, in the, medicine, in the medical space, that's a pretty powerful finding because especially with painkillers, yeah. And this is where a lot of the research is. If I can start to create what they call honest placebos, people know it's a placebo, we're not being deceptive, and we use it to create this mind-body biological conditioning and start to wean them down. Well, how powerful is that? And so ultimately, and this was a very long-winded way to get back to your original point, yeah. the biology of belief. If we can start to drive a uh, thing over here, can help me over there, 100%, I, I agree, you're going to have a higher rate of transfer likely. Yeah, beautiful. Um, another, so the other aspect, I, I think that, I agree with that it was really brilliant. And I think it's connected to, but slightly different maybe than the point that I was, that I was looking at, which is this idea that essentially you can imagine that there are like, um, there, let's say there's invariance of the task, right? The task of, med of concentration and meditation and the task of concentration and sport share certain invariant features. Yes. And that if I can get my nervous system to start to recognize those things as the same across different tasks, mm -hmm. then I'm going to be able to generalize how I utilize those features um, that can direct my attention effectively between different tasks. It's kind of how I've been thinking about it. And what that kind of brings me towards is the importance of understanding that essentially action is action is developed through intention, right? Intention precedes yes. action. And this is where I think I see a lot of people in our industry messing up and myself and certainly among them, right? I, I me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a young athlete, my self-perception was that I was less physically talented than some of the guys that were around me, but that I was more intelligent. And so my, my belief was that I could hack my way through a lack of physical talent by using my mind more. But what ended up happening was that I was trying to think about too many things, right? So you, you get the, the example of having the, um, the, the directions versus the GPS. Right. Yes, yes, so I was exactly. trying to hold all the directions in my mind um, each time that I did a movement and try to try to understand, try to be better at organizing the movement by knowing more about how the movement is organized. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, so so I, I wanted to, to have you get into that because I see it so often people. Uh, I'll give you a, a, an analogy. There's there's a pretty big brand in kind of my arena area within movement that uh when they teach a standing broad jump right so you've prepared athletes to do standing broad jumps in uh for the uh the combine yeah. for the combine right okay yes, yes. But when they instruct people to do their uh their standing broad jump they prescribe the depth of their counter movement they prescribe the, the specific motion of the arms during the jump or during the takeoff they also prescribe a, a very specific pattern of arm swing down in the middle of the jump. And they talk a lot about um, the height that they want the knees to get to in the middle of the jump in the flight phase. Yeah. So I've had many athletes now who've come who worked with them and then come to work with me. And repeatedly I've said, forget everything you were just told and focus on jumping as far as possible. So I haven't measured it with everyone, but with one athlete, he, he, you know, I was just trying to get a, uh, a, a good, good understanding of how the body actually produces force. And I can see that they're thinking all these cues, all these internal cues, and it's, it's interrupting their ability to actually just produce force on the ground and show me what their, what their natural characteristics are. So I had this athlete and I said, okay, well forget all those cues. And so he sent me a jump, it was 2.4 meters. So I, I took out, I just ripped all those cues out and had him throw them away. And he came back and did a 2.7 meter broad jump. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> 0.3 meter broad jump increase just from forgetting. Yeah. Forgetting information. Yep. So, so why, so t tell me a little bit about why, what your perspective is on that type of structure of trying to control a movement. Yes. Yeah. So, and this is where uh, a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of knowledge on motor control, which is exactly matters. Because if we know how the body controls movement, and let's say how the body controls movement implicitly or automatically, then we can start to appreciate, okay, well, what, what aspects of intention, what aspects of cognition uh, assist motor control versus which aspects of intention and cognition uh, resist motor control. And, and obviously we want the former, not the latter. And so again, I like to use a little bit of a thought experiment and I share this one in the book as well. Uh, that I think illustrates very clearly how motor control works and why the strategy right, that you used worked. And so let's say that you are, you know, you're moving, you're moving house, and you have all these boxes laid out. And one box is titled you know, pots and pans, and another one is bed linens. And let's say your partner is the one that packed the boxes, but didn't see the in the pots and pans box and put all of the pots and pans in the linens box. And so now you walk over, the boxes are all taped up, so you don't know what's inside of them. You walk over to the pots and pans box. Now, the second you read the words pots and pans, immediately you're processing in your brain what that means and what it is going to require to pick it up. You don't do it in that you're not calculating exact force and whatnot, but you have a general physical sense. It's like getting ready to get under a heavy bar. That emotional sense you have is almost the, the internal calculations going on of what is going to be required. And so when you bend down to grab under that box and stand up, that intention has sent out, so to speak, the outcome that you hope to achieve. You know, this should feel like X, this should feel heavy, and thus we need to deploy a lot of force and get deep to lift it up. And again, you don't have to think about that, but those are the kind of calculations under the hood that our motor system is making. And so when you get up under that, that linens box, what, or excuse me, that pots and pans box that has the linens in it, so it's far lighter than you had, here's a key word, predicted, what happens? You, you shoot up. And quite literally, your emotional response is what? Is one of surprise. And that emotional response of, of surprise in the motor system, we use a word, is perceived as error. And that error is, hold on. What I predicted would happen is not what happened. And so guess what? I would guarantee for at least that day, Every time you go up and you read carefully what's on that box, you might ask your partner, hey, what did you put in here? <laughs> and because that little bit of information did in what happened, there was a misprediction there. And so one has to intervene. But had it actually been filled with heavy pots and pans, your prediction would have been confirmed, would have been accurate. You would not have thought anything of it. You would have performed the movement and off you go. And so what does that tell us? It tells us that once we establish an intention, literally imagine a, a mind that takes that intention and converts it into this is what should happen. And this is what should happen equates to the biomechanics, the force, the kinematics, all the kind of technical stuff. Your brain, once you have an intention, predicts what should happen go on. And I'm not saying this as a turn of phrase. That's literally what happens. We, we talk about this future prediction. And when that prediction is confirmed, and how is it confirmed? Well, it's confirmed when the force I used and the movement I used and the proprioceptive feedback that came back to me after performing that. When all that gets confirmed, that's how we harden and deepen a motor pattern. But when that prediction is 
comes into contrast with what actually happened, that creates an error, as in my example. And that's when learning occurs. That's when self-correction occurs. That's when change occurs. And so when we think about these predictions, these predictions are anchored to our intention. The intention establishes the mental address, the mental GPS, the mental goal. Off that goal, the body then creates a physical blueprint of what should happen. And it's that physical blueprint, here's the kicker, that the body goes out and achieves. It's like when you rock up to a building site, what do they have? They have a blueprint and then they build based on the blueprint. That's how motor control works. There's a blueprint and the body builds towards it. And so what happens now when instead of giving the brain one blueprint, I give the brain five blueprints. Here's the blueprint for the load. Here's the blueprint for the jump. Here's the blueprint midair. Here's the blueprint for landing. Well, guess what? The brain doesn't work like that. It can't handle all of those blueprints simultaneously. So rather than having all of my resources working together to achieve one goal, I have the brain trying to flick through all of these micro goals simultaneously. And ultimately it's ineffective at achieving any one of them. And it's unable to put them all together despite the coach's intention to create one final outcome. It's as if people are working in isolation versus together. And so that was a very long drawn out way to get back to the point that when we coach, we have to give a singular outcome, a singular goal, a singular focus that ideally is inclusive of the whole movement. And what that does is it allows the body to generate the blueprint to achieve that outcome. So if we go back to this analogy of attention as a, um, as a spotlight, mm. if, if you give too many um, instructions, what you're asking the attention to do is flick between many different, yes. Um, yes. many different points. And then one thing you talk about in the book is this idea of having, of, of describing sort of, let's say the macro goal in such a way that the micro goals are automatically organized within. Bingo. Um, and I remember reading about like, what is typical of the, the, the best athletes in the world, something like Lionel Messi or Steph Curry or, you know, uh, LeBron James is that they, um, they have a, kind of a better hierarchy of what to pay attention to so that when they shine the spotlight at the right place, it reveals the next place that they can shine that spotlight more effectively. Mm -hmm. So I have this idea of like, you can shine your spotlight in one place and you see one thing, or you can shine your spotlight in something and it reveals, it's like through the lens of that one thing you're looking at, a bunch of other information comes through. Um, another way to think about this is, uh, if you imagine that room, there are certain features of the room that will rapidly tell you what everything around it is, whereas other features of the room are going to be very information poor. You're going to see something, but it doesn't show you, it doesn't let you fill in the rest of that, of that picture. Is that a good yeah. way of thinking about this? Yeah, no, I, I, I think, it, and probably many people are familiar with the fable of the, the elephant and the five blind men. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, the, the, the way it goes is these five uh, blind gentlemen have never experienced nor seen nor touched an elephant. And, and one comes up to the trunk and says, ah, an, an elephant is, is something that is, that is long. And then someone grabs the tail. Oh, no, it is something that is thin. And then another person grabs the, the foot and says, what are you talking about? It's, it's round and thick like a, a tree trunk. And then another person grabs, you know, it touches the body, says, no, it's vast like a desert. And so technically they're all correct and they're all incorrect. And that they're only describing a micro, a feature of what is a larger macro. And this is ultimately where coaches go astray. They are falling into the same trap as, as the blind men are when they are touching the elephant and that they are trying to give a micro cue a cue, so to speak, about one small component of the movement and hoping that the athlete can simultaneously while they still coordinate the entire body during the broad jump. And ultimately, as we have said, the only way that that can happen, one, it can't happen literally because 
that they're basically taking the spotlight, zooming into the knee and zooming out to the body, zooming into the knee and zooming out to the body. And they have to, there's that time lag of the zoom in to zoom out piece. And so when the action is continuous and it's fast, that lag between zooming in and zooming out disrupts the focus, as you've been saying, of the right thing at the right time. And what's the right thing? The right thing is the outcome. Explode out as far as you can. That then allows the body to say, okay, that's a singular blueprint and the body self-organizes to achieve it. Our job is not the directions. Our job is the address. And it doesn't mean that I don't prepare you. Hey, this is going to be three hours in the car. You're going to have to make 10 turns along the way. I can tell you that because I'm psychologically preparing you for this trip you're about to go on. However, that's very different than how you're going to get there. Now, to get there, here's the address. It's ultimately just that address that you as the, as the athlete, you as the driver need to successfully complete the outcome. The other pieces are more like for your information and should be used as FYI to the degree that you feel the athlete is either interested or would benefit from knowing a bit more detail. But let's not confuse descriptive language with coaching language. And that's the, the main theme I'm trying to push forward in the book. Yeah, yeah, I think of that as a lot of like folks like myself that we get, we get addicted to the language of analysis. Yes, And yes. then we can, we can fail to see that no, uh, you know, as you, you know, knowing what happens is not the same as knowing how, how, to, do it. how to do it. Yes, so, um, yes. Uh, just, I wanted to, 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 that GPS thing, there's one thing I'm hung up on there, which is that before yeah, we go for it. GPS, you needed all the steps, right? And so I, I don't know if you do, if I didn't catch it in the way you described the analysis, but essentially what you're saying is that you, that when it comes to the relationship between the, the, the motor control system and the conscious mind, yes, the motor control system is that GPS that, that yes. it, that it yes. self-organizes those directions for you if you give it the right address to go to you got it yes i, I think that is um that is a clear and accurate non-deceptive analogy of how it works yes beautiful so and can i just can i give a, a a slight footnote example on how this works because many people when they first start to to study because what we're talking about here is the use of, of external language, you know, language that is anchored in the physical environment and in the outcomes I'm trying to achieve. You know, yes, I might need hip extension and knee extension during a broad jump, uh, but ultimately those two things are inconsequential if I don't maximally project out to jump as far as I can. No, no one's assessing my success at the NFL combine with a goniometer on my hip. They're assessing it with a measuring stick on how far I can go. And so we, we can't lose, lose sight of that. So uh, an ana analogies, not an analogy, but analogies in general are a useful construct to understand how technical nuance can get hidden in, in a macro outcome oriented cue. And so the one I use all the time, because I think as an entry into studying basically a, a intro class to linguistics here, it's a simple one. And that is if I'm teaching someone to sprint, and we can all imagine Usain Bolt on the starting line, just kind of picture that. And I say, okay, I need you to explode out and up off that line like a jet taking off. And that was all I said. Now, most people, assuming they've seen a jet taking off, and at least for the purpose of this exercise, have seen someone sprint from a 100 meters perspective and, and notably Usain Bolt, they can start to map those two things together in their mind quite quickly. You know, creatively, our visual system is able to do that with ease. In fact, it wasn't like you had to try to do that. It's like someone who speaks English having to try to understand the words I'm saying. No, it automatically happened the second the words hit your mind because that's frankly how your mind processed the words. And we could actually get into that as well. And so explode off, out and up, off the line like a jet taking off. Now, that is, that is the micro outcome goal for the initial instigation of and so hiding and the key word here is like a trojan horse hiding inside that analogy there's some really interesting things and the interesting things are in the comparison 
between a jet taking off and a person driving off a line from a sprint perspective. So let's look at the comparison. The first thing is, what does a jet do? It goes from low to high. What does a body need to do in a sprint? Go from low to high. Uh, a jet uses incredible propulsion, especially early on, right? When you're in the jet, you feel that initial impulse at takeoff. Well, what do we do from an accelerative perspective? Well, the highest rate of acceleration is in the first three steps. So exact same kind of propulsive emphasis from a force in an engine perspective. Um, if we look at then the shape of a jet, well, it's, it's long and it's cylindrical from toe or, or tip to tail. And it's made out of a, a firm, strong material. Well, as my back foot comes off the ground, as I finish pushing in a start from head to heel, I want to see a long from the side view, one might even argue cylindrical type position with great strength. And so I could, I could keep going, but I won't. But I think the, the, the idea and the thought experiment is clear that what happens is we get the visual cognitively of the jet taking off and it's logical comparison to a sprint. What our implicit motor system is able to do with that is start to map all of those sub features, but we don't have to think about it. That's the beauty of the Im implicit mind and the motor system. It gets the punchline. And so that's how it happens. And the best way to articulate this implicit, invisible stuff that you don't need to think about is simple. It's the F word, feeling. It's how the cue makes you feel. And let me just to bring that forward for the listeners and yourself. I want to go through two different words. The word push and the word punch. I mean, Rafe, for you, do those words feel the same? That's an odd question, but it's not an odd question. No, you're shaking your head. No, they don't feel the same because what those words are anchored to are something different. A push is, yes, it's upper body, but it's long and slow in comparison to the violent, fast uh, nature of the word punch. And so hiding inside of our language, we get visuals. We get emotional hashtags within manufacture in terms of feeling. And insofar as a analogy or a cue is based on something physical, i.e. verbs, action words, that feeling manifests itself in our physical body, in our bodily awareness. And so it, it's, it's important for people to recognize that the body and the brain and their partnership is far more intelligent then we give it credit if we behaviorally look at many coaches. Behaviorally, if we look at many coaches, it's as if we had, would have had to explain to our child how to stand, walk, and run. Yet nobody teaches the child how to stand, walk, and run. If knowledge of step-by-step -step what was required to move, how do children move pre-verbal? They wouldn't be able to. And so these are just powerful intuitions that we need to interrogate and start to step back and say, hold on. We confused our biomechanical textbooks and the importance of our knowledge of what and the analysis of with how we actually coach them to achieve. And the reality is while they are related, they are not the same. I do, need to, I do not need to have a working understanding of the i7 processor inside my computer to play a video game. And so that, again, is not meant to be a deceptive analogy. It's a clear analogy and an accurate one. We have to be very strict with ourselves as coaches on how much information we reveal and most certainly respect the fact that the directions are not the same as the address. Um, we're about five minutes over the timeline that you gave me. I feel like we've really just started the conversation. Uh, let's keep let's keep riffing here for a little while. My 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 kids are not banging down the door yet, so okay. we'll uh, cool. we'll use them, we'll use them as our uh, barometer. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, so external cues. Um, that's perfect. Actually, I, that was right on my list. Uh, you know, three three questions down was why take off like a jet plane, not like a helicopter, right? Yes, and why that's important. So within that idea of the external cues, you talked about your, uh, the three Ds of the cue. Can you give us a little yes. bit of information about what those three Ds are and why they're so important in, um, in organizing how we communicate with 
our athletes, and then if we are athletes, how we organize our internal communication. Yes, for sure. Um, when we look at this whole idea of internal and external cues, to understand that from a coaching perspective, external cues should be the kind of language we use to drive intention, to establish the, the goal, the address in the mind. For many coaches, that's, that's them just getting to the starting line. You know, they just showed up at the party. Because once I tell coaches, hey, you know, external cues or demonstrate, let's say, that external cues are more effective than internal cues when it comes to what the athlete should think about while they move, they still oftentimes, and myself included when I started, become a, a crafts person, so to speak, of cues. And many people, if we reflect on it, rely on the same cues and the same language that either was used to coach us or maybe that we've heard from another coach. And the odd time will come up with a new one. But I, at least speaking from experience, would use the same kind of cues over and over again. And so once I started studying external language and the value of it in coaching movement, the, the whole idea of the three Ds just it revealed itself to me. It wasn't like I went searching for it, but I just started to notice a trend in the language that I was using. And it seemed to always have these three ingredients. And so <clears throat> these ingredients, when we dig into them, operate like space and time. They tell us where to move in space and how fast to go there. It's that simple. So as I explain them, think about it that way, is that these ingredients help me know where to go in space and how fast to get there. And really, if you think about movement, space and time, that's it. How do I move through space and how quickly? That is what I'm trying to achieve. And even Einstein said, you know, uh, our, our mind operate and, and is constrained by space and time. So for me, it would make sense that if I'm trying to navigate the physical world, I want to use language that represents the space and time that I'm constrained by. I, and I think that's a genuinely interesting and accurate way to look at it. So, okay, what kind of language do we need to use to help the person set an intention that will give the body, so to speak, the coordinates and the uh, time constraints to get there? And so the first D is distance. And so am I focusing on something that is close to me or far away? And the distance, and because we're getting into nuance, we'll, I'll go deeper than I normally do on this, distance is established by the noun, the physical person, place, or thing inside of the queue. And so let's stick with sprinting. If I was to say, explode off the ground, the ground is the noun, it is close to me. If I say explode to the finish line, the finish line is the noun, right? It is the place, it is the thing that I'm going towards. And so when I reference the physical environment, it will live on the scale of something close to far away. One is not better than the other. Sorry, Nick. My yeah, no, hey, hey, listen, if, it, if we're not getting kids on a podcast, it's, it's, it's not worthwhile during this time. Um, <laughs> so, so sorry. So, no, 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 it's totally cool. Maybe I can totally move cool. into the living room because we're going to end the now. I, I, I love, I love it. I love it. Okay. A little, a little interruption there, but Nick, no, 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 all good. You're just laying down. So you're talking about the noun specifies yeah, so the, the, distance. the distance. Exactly. The noun. So, so explode off the ground in a sprint would be close. Explode towards the finish is far in a bench. Bench, the bench is the noun, right? Is, is close and drive the bar towards the ceiling is far. Okay. So that's, that's our first variable. And you know, we, we could get into it, but people are thinking, well, immediately, well, okay, should the cue be close or far? Well, I'd ask everyone to think, would you rather drive the barbell and a bench press away from the bench or toward the ceiling? And if we had the classroom, we'd probably get half saying one and half saying the other. And so that's my point. No, it's not better or worse. It's just a variable that you can manipulate. You know, typically I'll say this, if you're trying to learn a complex task, start with cues that are close to the body because what it does is it draws the attention more to the immediate part of the environment I'm interacting with, like the ground on a foot contact. Mm -hmm. But as power and explosivity become more important, then as you did with your, with your broad jump, Rafe, right? We tell them to explode out as far as they can 
towards this end point. And so there's, there's just a couple different ideas in the book. Obviously I get into all the different ways and reasons behind manipulating distance. Yeah, and so I, distance, distance is the first one. The second one then is direction. So direction, am I literally, am I moving towards something or away from something? That simple. And in, when, we, when we talk about that from a language perspective, we're talking about fancy word, right? Prepositions here. So toward, away, in, out, up, down. And so the preposition and the noun tell me, am I moving toward this thing or away from this thing? And again, if I was to ask people, would you rather explode away from the line or toward the finish? Some are going to prefer the toward, some are going to prefer the away. So there's not one is not better than the other. But distance and direction establish the physical space. But it's not just space, is it? It's space and time. There's still a temporal parameter for movement, you know, fast or slow. I just don't know. So I need to have some kind of language that gives the person an indication of how to navigate that space. And so the final D is what I crudely just called the description. And the description comes through final kind of, let's say, bit of grammar here in, uh, in, in the verb, in the action verb. And so if we go back to my cues on sprinting, explode off the ground. Explode is the verb drive away from the ground drive is the verb push the ground away punch the ground away and as i as i demonstrate when i run courses on this i'll put a bunch of verbs on the screen and have people write down what that verb makes them think of and ultimately what i think of when i hear the verb sometimes it's this uh, pop i have the sense of a popcorn exploding or the crack of opening a soda can or me popping off the ground, but another person thinks of cereal, snap, crackle, pop, rice, crack, you know what I mean? It's like, well, that, that, that verb probably isn't going to really drive the explosivity that I'm looking for. And so just like close and far, toward and away, the, the essence of the action verb is going to be highly individualized. So for me, of all the variables I manipulate the most, I play around verbs more than anything else to try to find the language that resonates with the person. And the other variable under description is then the use of analogy. And so the way I articulate it in the book is distance, direction, and description are what we use to use literal cues. Literally in the environment, the bar, the bench, the ground, the start, the finish, it's literally in my environment. But analogies still create space and time, but they create a visual in the mind. And those are what I call the figurative external cues. It's like Neo in the matrix. I can pretend there's a wall next to me. I can pretend my body is a jet taking off. I can, here's the key, move as if. But still in the case of an analogy, if we think about the vast majority of them, they are going to complement how I move in space and how quickly I move in space. And so the, that's, that's long-winded, but hopefully some interesting nuance of the three Ds, the ingredients. And I work at length to help the readers of the book practice and, and nurture each D, but then learn how to bring them all together. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful for f- folks, you know, everyone by the book. Um, I, uh, I, I was just looking through it and I was like, just getting excited about going back and taking like the movements that we use and building like, you know, yes. I'm going to build a doc where I'm going to say, okay, here's a bunch of different verbs that we can use and, and how they're going to translate. So um, I wanted to, to just like workshop a little bit of this with you, if you don't mind. Cool. Um, yeah. So we're talking about, uh, uh, one thing that came up for me was you're talking about like, pu- you asked me push versus punch. Yes. Right? And so I was thinking about, uh, in the book, you talk about, well, first of all, we talk about what does that mean to the athlete, right? Yes. So like for me, that has, that's, that, that's a really strong cue in a sense, because I have, I've been a martial artist since I was six years old. So when I think punch, I think like embedded in punch for me is the concept of kime, the ability to be loose until you become hard. Right. Can I, I that. can I have I that, that, yes. that, that absolute hardness at the moment of impact? And then, and then push is long, is, is that slow, you know, mm-hmm. more impulse oriented yep. approach to movement. And so I was thinking about, uh, as you're talking about that, I was thinking about the idea of like, 
in the in the book you talk about people who sprint like they've watched too much Looney Tunes, right? <laughs> We're trying to take too many steps, right? Yes. Yeah. So you could think that for for that athlete, I'm guessing that something like um, drive or push might be an effective cue in that acceleration phase to get them to spend more time on the ground applying force. Slow down. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You got it. Yeah. But then as they reach peak speed, that push cue is going to be too slow potentially. And something like a punch cue is going to give a better description of the type of action that you're wanting for that foot on the ground. Yeah. Rafe, I, I, I love, I love where you're taking this because you're, you're spot on. And once as coaches, once we understand the level of nuance you just eloquently articulated, for me, mine just opens up. And that I, I've, in, in recent years, I just don't find myself struggling to work, I like the word, to workshop out with the athlete. Yeah. See, that's the key thing we're both alluding to here, is m most of my cue creation, I'm riffing on it, you know, in real time with the athlete. Say, well, what does this mean to you? Or how does this feel to you until we get to the right solution? But even then, to your point, your understanding of the conventional understanding of different words and what they mean and what they're associated with, valuable to get you on the right foot, to start putting suggestions forward to the athlete that are going to increase the odds of their success. So I, I love the way you're thinking about this. One of the things that I did after I encountered your work was I started actually asking my, my athletes, yes. did you feel like that helped you organize better? So I'd be like, here's a cue, you do the thing, and, uh, and then, oh, did it help? Um, and even when I'm getting coached, sometimes like I'll, I'll work with acrobatics coaches who don't have as much experience with coaching as me, but they understand the skill better. And I'll, I'll, they'll, they'll, they'll just give me this huge list of things. I'll be like, okay, you can give me one cue, one <laughs> cue that's going to help me organize this and I can help them with that. So, um, uh, so I wanted to, to look at a, a specific skill and, and talk about the, the cues that I built and like look at them through the lens of what we've just what, just done. So in parkour, Sweet. we have a skill called the climb up. And in a climb up, you start on a wall um, with your hands hanging from the wall and with your feet on the wall. Are you with me, Nick? There we are. So climb yep. up. Ha yeah, ha hands on the wall. Got it. Yes. Yeah. And, you're, and then you're going to have one, you're going to have both feet sort of on the wall, but one foot's higher generally. Okay. Got it. Yes. Like you're running up the wall almost. Yeah. So then from this position, you're going to do a kind of muscle up technique where you're going to pull and try to catch with your elbows extended, you know, in a support position on top of the wall. Um, and there's variations of this as you progress, but the ultimate is that you can pull and catch with basically straight arms and then kick your back leg and come up on top. Okay. This is one of the more difficult skills, kind of like one of the really benchmark skills for a parkour athlete as they progress, because it gives you a much faster way to get on top of a wall, which is a very slow process otherwise. Okay. So. And so um, sorry for my own visual, as I'm kind of coming up and getting my arms straight, is that then meant to propel, to propel me up so that I, okay, you're gonna show me, beautiful. Yeah, I'll just yeah. go ahead and show. Let's do it, yeah. Um, because your explanation was good. I think I, I have 99. So, so here we go. Oh, see that? Yeah. Okay. So time for me. Uh, yeah. I'm going to slow this down. Tell me if you can actually see it. Yeah, I can. I can see it. Yep. Straight. Okay. So, so this, yeah. So they, they kind of get up and over and they create enough kind of up for momentum just to get their legs then onto the wall. And then they push and go. Yeah. So this, yeah. uh, this middle one is the, is the primary version that, that we're looking for this, 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 uh, this, uh, this fourth one over here is a level four climb up. That's much less common. So this level three okay. climb up is what we're, what we're talking about. So in the level three climb up, you start, for me, yeah. yeah, we start in this, 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 modified hanging position right but with a foot supporting on a vertical wall and then we drive with the leg you see that knee drive and then there's the catch position notice the extension of the arms and then immediately 
his foot is, uh, there's one foot on the wall and the other foot is driving the heels coming up and he lands on top, okay? So. To create that, that additional vertical momentum so they can clear their feet on the wall. Mm -hmm. Yep, got it, makes sense. So we have a few different moving pieces here. One is what is the action of this higher leg that's pressing into the wall? The second is what is the action of the lower leg? And then the last is how, how do we actually complete the pull? And then there's also the, the press, right? So let's, let's just look at the, the getting to support position. Yep, right? yep. So the first thing is if, um, if as he begins his pull, his, uh, his shin gets too vertical too fast. I mean, you can see it's going vertical, but if it gets too vertical too fast, he's gonna be pressing down and he's gonna lose all of his normal force into the wall. Yep. Right. And then, so the second piece is that lower leg you'll see has a very powerful knee drive. And this acts kind of like a kip in a kipping pull up. Yep. And then the last piece um, is, how does his how does he pull right um where where does the shoulders go and so as i as i was working on this what i what i try to to externalize the language of this cue right so you might internalize this by you know saying like uh, focus on keeping a, a a negative shin angle as you're pushing yeah, with yeah. with that lower leg you know or you know uh you know, use your stomach to pull that knee up or, you know, fire your lats, drive your elbows, right? Um, so the way that I tried to externalize this cue was um, focus on pushing into the wall with the, the higher foot rather than down. Yes, yes. Um, and then this is interesting. What worked for me really well with the climb up is think about ripping the wall down. So yes, I'm pulling myself up on top of the wall. I'm literally thinking about trying to rip the wall to the ground and that somehow yeah. created a more powerful pulling pattern. And the last one, this is an interesting one because this is this idea of taking an internal cue and externalizing it that you talk about. It's the same yeah. cue that you give for knee drive or very similar cue to, to what you give for knee drive in the sprint. So to drive that knee up. You could think of it as drive that knee up like breaking a plane of glass as you do. Yeah. In my background as a martial artist, what I think is drive that knee up like I'm trying to knock somebody out with it. Yep, yep, exactly. Yep, same difference, beautiful. So, um, so I just thought that this would be an interesting thing. So, 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 we're, um, so what's the direction, right? The direction of that, of the first thing is, you know, you're going into the wall, not down, right? So we're using- Before, before you do this though, I think, it's import I, I think it's important to highlight that, you know, Thinking around pulling the wall down mm -hmm. does not, for, for the upper body, does not by its very nature suggest um, to the, the parkour athlete that only the upper body is involved, but by its very nature of the verbalization of pulling the wall body. But let's be very clear, it is not constraining the movement by asking them to just think about shoulder, elbow, or wrist. And so we have, to, we have to fight that sense that, oh, well, that's just, how am I gonna get those nuanced changes? Well, by the very fact you said pull the wall down, the word pull is organized, and here's the nerd out for a second, in the part of the motor cortex associated with the upper body. Okay, so quite literally, it'll be impossible to, to commit yourself. I think that's an important word. When you commit yourself to that cue fully, um, it's going to emphasize the upper body. So for the person that's lagging in that pull, in terms of the whole system organization, that is a really good way to anchor the organization. You know, as I say, there's many ways to skin a cat. There's many ways to anchor the outcome of a movement. Yeah. Uh, equally, so, so that's the first point there. And so you're right. You could either pull yourself up or, pull, or push down on it and, and i love that I, I call it inversing physics mm. it's kind of like i can't i can't push i can't push the ground away literally but i talk about pushing the ground away all the time mm. and what it does is it suggests to the mind that figuratively if i were to push the ground literally away the amount of force to do that would be astronomical <laughs> and so by the very nature of saying you know smash the wall into the ground or push the wall into the ground you know or you know uh, put the toast in the toaster, almost something like that, like the wall's a piece of toast. And that whole idea of downwards, by its very nature, 
suggests a, a large force is going to be required. So that's my first just kind of interpretation of the upper body one. And then in terms of the leg on the wall, the push leg, yeah, I, I, I love that. Again, you're manipulating physics there. You know the tendency is to probably have the foot slip off the wall. And so because we know the force needs to be down for me to go up, but by the very nature of it, pushing, pushing into the wall is going to maximize the grip. And the intention of going up the wall by its very nature is going to give me the vertical force. Yep. I, I don't need to say get down the wall. The fight or flight of the, the physics of where I am in space is going to automatically bias that. So telling them to push in versus down makes a lot of sense. And so the key cue there is how you're manipulating the preposition, how you're manipulating the directionality. But even then, if by the very nature of my hands are on the wall and I'm telling them to push in, this is still all going to have to work together. But in the same way that the, upper, that the word pull is anchored to upper body in the motor cortex, the word push is anchored to the lower body in the motor cortex. So again, it's still outcome-oriented language, but it's just biasing, so to speak, the trigger of the movement to that lower body pushing mechanism. And because we have reciprocating action in this type of movement, as it is analogous to running, um, it might not be that the push is the issue. It might be that the momentum of the drive is the issue. Mm -hmm. So once again, drive into the glass as if you're shattering it, still biases the lower body, but in the spirit of the whole system, creating this upward motion. So we have three different anchor points. There are three different roads to Rome. They still respect the organization of the whole system. They don't explicitly bias any one muscle or joint, which would draw attention away from the other ones. But rather, I like to think of it as, as the trigger. It's the domino I use to knock over the rest of the dominoes. And so just beautiful use of the principle. What you've illustrated that so many people miss is you could have someone performing that movement and their limiting factor could be the push. It could be the leg on the wall or the leg going up. And tell me if I have any of this wrong. But in any three of those cases, I could have 10 different people but I could still achieve the same technical outcome, but by turning over, you, know, you need this domino to get the cascade to happen, and this person needs that domino, but we still get to the same endpoint. And you, you're, you're expressing in that example a mastery, and I use that word precisely, of these principles, because so often people think, oh, you just tell me I gotta tell people to jump high and that's it, end of story. I'm like, no, you have to understand how language is embedded in the motor system and how that triggers the body to organize against that intention. And I, I normally don't say things like that on, on most podcasts, but we're down into this nuance, deep area, which tells me we want to go there. So for what it's worth, I think that was brilliant. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. That's, that's, that's a high praise coming from you. Um, and, and, it's, and it's, it's directly due to your influence, right? Like I've been uh, able to, to learn so much about the language of coaching. It's, and I think it's such an underutilized tool. Like yeah. um, oh, for sure. there's just, there's so much here. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, like what's the difference between selling, telling someone to pull the wall down versus telling someone to rip the wall down? Yeah, yeah. Right. For, for how can we exactly? How do we we find those little nuances that allow us to communicate with the specific athlete? Like, uh, you know, I think one thing that's really interesting to me is how how easy it is to forget what's in, what's in your your head might not be in somebody else's head. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and as you probably have seen, I call that the language locker. And so what's in your language locker is not what's in their language locker. And as coaches, we need to recognize that as you just clearly identified, but then it's only through collaborating with the athlete that we get to sample what's in their language locker, which is critical. Okay. So if I have time for one more question, what I want to ask yeah, you. About, one yeah. more. I heard, I heard the call of the wild from downstairs. Okay, the, wall, the call of the wild is going. <laughs> so let's, let's talk a little bit about the coaching loop, right? Yes. I think this is such a brilliant concept for people to think about how are they breaking this down and, and what is the thing that they're offering at each peeps? So if I remember correctly, it's DDCD is your, uh, your acronym for it. Yeah, DDCDD. Yeah, f five steps, like a, like a rap, like a rap song. Just say it a few times, and it'll get stuck in your head. <laughs> there we go. Give us a little beat for it. DDDCDD. Yeah. Exactly. DDCDD. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we have um, we have describe, demonstrate. Yep. Um, sorry, I'm I'm blanking on the C for uh, for me. Um, Q. Do it and debrief it. You got it. 
Right. So th that described portion, that's where we're able to give the, the, the directions, right? Yeah, um, the steps. The, yeah, that's, the steps. You know, that's the, hey, this is, you know, just like you did there for me on that video. Yep. You're, you explained what happened, but then that's actually, you, you almost, you did it perfectly, actually, <laughs> is you described exactly what's going on. And then you gave me your cues. You said, now to do that, mm -hmm. here's the stuff that we would ask people to focus on. Yeah, and that's the, and so the video was the demonstration. You mm -hmm. gave me a clear description, no more, no less. And then you shared your cues. And so that, that brilliant, actually, that's exactly how it should roll out when we are uh, coaching others. And, and notably, right, if I was one of your students, I, you wouldn't have to re-show me that video or re-demonstrate every time, just as you wouldn't have to re-describe every time. And so that's why in the book, I make the distinction between the long loop and the short loop. And so the long loop is or reteaching a skill or teaching a skill for the first time, you describe, demonstrate, cue, duty, brief. But then once they've got it, just your, so to speak, the, the Swiss army knife, the tool that you're pulling out all the time is attention, set the outcome, set the address in the mind, allow them to get after it. And then you riff, you have your, your debrief, you discuss how to go. Was their subjective experience on par with what you objectively saw? And that's the goal is to get our language to cause an objective change that is equally experienced subjectively from a body awareness by the person. And if we get that going on, man, we're money. Okay, so we're uh, we're thirty three minutes over the time that that we had. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let let us stop there. There's a wonderful place to stop, Nick. Um, this has been such an amazing conversation. So uh, I, I really appreciate having the chance to do it again. So um, thank you for being on. And, uh, any last words? More movements. I like that. That's a fun thing to do. No, no. I, I really I appreciate the opportunity. And what I love what I love about the language of coaching is it is universal. It's, it's helping me to, to connect and reach out to the movement profession. And at the end of the day, across the movement profession, we're all here as servants to get others better. So for me, it's been a privilege to share some of these insights today better. So the book is The Language of Coaching, The Art and Science of Teaching Movement. Um, you have theartofcoaching.com, I believe, or something like that. Yeah, it's uh, the, the language of coaching.com. I try to keep everything simple. Everything's by the title of the book, YouTube, website, everything. Yep, you got yeah, it. People can find you there. Do you have, do you have workshops? I, mean, I guess there's. <laughs> well, not, not right now, but now that the book is done, I will be building out, you know, online and face-to-face and -face courses, but everything I'm doing uh, right now is, is to be uh, the book club that I'm running right now. So registration is still open. I've run the first of four sessions. And so those will be going live. The next one's June 17th. So if people pop over to my Instagram or my website, uh, they can register to join the book club. And then they're all on YouTube recorded afterwards. Awesome. That's, that's right. So people know how to keep, uh, getting, uh, uh, keep following your work. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Evolve Move Play podcast. If you want to support what we're doing, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that notifications button so you know what's coming up. And of course, the biggest support you can give is to become a Patreon supporter. This is what's going to allow us to grow this platform more than anything else. So this is entirely listener supported, and we really appreciate your support. And we look forward to talking to you again soon.